incarnate. And they consist of all the memes, all the talking points, all the, uh, you know, some of the absurdities and paradoxes of it. And I just thought that was a very interesting contrast, the effectiveness and, and the look of what it's like in real life running for office as these two candidates were or what it was online. I mean, do you think there is something about uh, the the fact or the nature of being anonymous, of being online that in this day and age is, is more effective politically? Because I just thought that was a very interesting idea that you kind of brought up with him. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I break my answer down into two parts. One, yeah, I think anonymity online definitely played a, a crucial role. It's a, a large factor in, I guess you could call it propagandizing. Mm. Uh, they're able to get a message out. Uh, they're able to deliver a, a concise message in a way that resonates with people. Uh, and really, it comes down to who's funnier, uh, <clears throat> the better the better memes, I guess. Uh, but that that helps facilitate getting a message out for a candidate. I, I think that played a large role in the election, you know, from anti-Hillary to pro-Trump. I, th I think that definitely had an effect. And I think anonymity helped. If you're identified and you try to do a lot of what was done, you're just going to get hammered into the fucking dirt. Hmm. I mean, we saw that with uh, the kid that uh, tweeted out. It was like a, a wrestling gift that was altered. It had Trump in there, and CNN was right on him, saying that if you do this, we're going to release your information and write up a story on you. But because you promised not to do it anymore, we're going to sweep it under the rug. We're going to forget about it. As far as uh, you know, the viability of candidates like Little or Neilan, I mean, they, I don't want to try to undercut the effect they had. I mean, Little was running in California, correct? Correct. Yeah, and I mean, people will make fun of him, say, well, he only got 1% of the vote. Well, you couldn't go to a more liberal, democratic, blue fucking state than California. The fact that he even got 1% is impressive on its own, coupled with the message he was preaching. It, it really actually surprised me. And I think Neilan got, was it 15% against Polanyi in 2016? Or am I am I wrong on that? Uh, well, yeah, but that was before he went full red pill. He was more of a, a MAGA Pete at the time. But but you're right. I mean, nevertheless, 15% in the primary. Right, right. And I think when you were talking to him, you brought that up, didn't you? You said, you know, people were out door knocking for you. They were getting your message out there. And then you kind of changed, changed stances after we kind of got your name out there uh, to the point where that 15% that was built up might be jeopardized now if you were to run in the future. Yeah, that's right. Completely evaporated, I'm sure. I, I know the people that I was one of the door knockers and I knew the people that were uh, among them and the people we were knocking on the doors of. <laughs> I know the uh, the new message would probably not appeal as explicit as it is, right? Uh, maybe not in uh, that's Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, the first district. Maybe not as much in Wisconsin, but I, again, I mean, it is interesting that they were able to take in the numbers they could. Uh, what would Neilan pull in the future? I don't know. If Patrick Little changed his message, will he pull in more of a a percentage? Probably not. But, uh, you know, again, 1% in California. <laughs> what <if> the <laughs> message that he had is that is, in my opinion, a victory, considering what he's fucking dealing with in that particular state. Right. Yeah, it was an interesting experiment. And, you know, uh, I, I do think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he ran as a civil rights advocate, you know, because I imagine in a state like California, it's obviously the largest state, I think, by population and a large minority population. Well, it's I don't even think it's fair to call the minority in California the majority. You know, it's a minority white state running as a civil rights advocate. I think that that was actually an intelligent, a clever kind of a trick, but but definitely an interesting experiment. And and I bring it up, the uh, the nature of anonymity and these kinds of things, because I think that's a big part of people like your effectiveness and other YouTubers, other people that are making change, because you see what people are up against, like myself and others who are out there and we've got our faces out. Once you kind of manifest in the real world, once you can be identified and you have liabilities and things that people can look after or go after, I think it becomes a much different equation in terms of how you're able to parse out your message. I mean, do you think that's a big part of it? I, I think that's true to an extent. I mean, take you, for example. You're 19, right? Mm -hmm, correct. Uh, I mean, you already have a Wikipedia page. True. Like, your online footprint is cemented. If you were to try to go anonymous past this, that's always going to be there. Mm. You know what I mean? Once you kind of come out and you, you kind of askew and throw away the anonymity, uh, whether it's willingly or unwillingly, um, it, it, it's, it, anonymity is almost like uh, virginity. You know, once once you get <laughs> right. fucked, there's no one fucking it. So once once it's out there, it's done with. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I find anonymity to be an important integral part of the Internet. I mean, it has been since its inception. 
from message boards to image boards and onward. I mean, it's always been something that has allowed people to speak freely. And when you take that away, it just it, it seems like a bad idea to me. I, I know a lot of social media platforms, a lot of uh, conglomerates and corporations want to strip it away. Facebook and the Twitters and all of them want as much information as they can get. If you want a Gmail account, you need to give them, you know, your your phone number. And before that, it was an address and a name and just ridiculous amounts of information because for some reason, they're terrified of the idea of an anonymous user base. I mean, you can see this in comment sections on websites from news sites to even scientific journals where they've uh, you know, either done away with anonymous comments or they're asking for a real ID identification to actually be able to post comments now on certain websites. So there's, there's a change taking place. And I don't think we should be pushing it along. I think we should be dragging our feet as much as we can and enjoying it while we can, because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, kids growing up on the Internet will probably look back and be like, holy shit, you could be anonymous online. That's fucking wild. But, uh, fun guy, obviously. Intelligent, too. It's kind of interesting because I was reading some article earlier in the week about how comedians are having like a political responsibility now. Which I don't think is true, by the way. They said people like Stephen Colbert and others, John Oliver, now have to be political as well as comedians. And I think the corporate stuff is very vapid, but I think there is something to be said about the humorists like Jim and I think the new wave of true-to-form humorists, people on the internet, I think are becoming that way. I think there's there's has to be some element of intuitive understanding of incisive wit about what's going on in, in some political context to make jokes that are relevant to people. So great guest, great conversation.